Good morning. That is uh, it's Friday morning here. It's raining outside. And we're going to wrap up our NT studies. Thanking my friend Tim Alcorn for helping with the setup here. Um, this morning, after, or, yeah, I'll go keep saying this morning. We're going to do uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then 2 Peter and Jude. We'll treat together and that's going to be a wrap. If you have any questions, uh, you can email me or text me or whatever. Let's start with prayer, shall we? Our Lord of Heaven, thank you for the privilege of doing this class together and for uh, the opportunity to uh, be able to deliver it this uh, techie way. We pray especially that you will touch hearts as we look into your word, help us to on each of these. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Um, 1 John is one of those, one of the more challenging letters um, that it's so simple in terms of vocabulary. Um, so much of the thought seems uh, fairly transparent, and yet the way he expresses things and the flow of his thoughts uh, almost defy our ability to um, explain to to be confident that we've got this thing uh, figured out what he's doing there um, are there's a variety of views as to what the book is really about and uh, it's one of the most difficult in the New Testament to try to outline I of course have, had to, have given you an outline in my Bible arguments and um, I hope in, I don't know, sometime to be able to come back and revisit that outline because I've decided that I don't agree with it in uh, some important places. But uh, there's a lot that we can uh, glean. Um, and uh, I, I want to focus on the big ideas and some uh, major distinctives about this epistle. Um, its similarity to the Gospel of John and to 2nd and 3rd John is so obvious, it's so huge, that uh, any doubts about these coming from the same author are really forced and uh, uh, hard to sustain. So I'm going to dispense with discussions about authorship. Uh, it, there's so much in here that uh, says that this is the same author and that this author was an apostle. Um, and I will take you through some of those uh, uh, indications. Uh, but I want to start with uh, some something of the key ideas of the book. So I've got it on the screen there. I'll email this to you. Those first two paragraphs, uh, first of all, the occasion, and then, uh, then that second paragraph is a key theme 
assurance. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and make this just a little bit bigger. Verses 30 and 31, many other signs Jesus did. And these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son, is the uh, Messiah, Son of God. That one was written that you might believe. This one is written to you who believe that you might know, that you might know that you have eternal life. So uh, this one seems to be about assurance of salvation. Interesting that uh, over in chapter 2, uh, in uh, well, where did it go? Verse 3. I was looking at verse 6. Um, in chapter 2, verse 3, by this we know that we know. Did you see that? By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. But what I'm calling attention to is that he's saying, we know that we know. Uh, and so this seems to complement what we saw there in uh, chapter Five, okay. Um, as well, then I find these several more uh, statements, and including uh, uh, a five-verse paragraph in the middle of chapter four that uh, uh, that seem to go the same direction. Let's just go through those really quickly. Chapter 2, verse 21. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. Because no lie is of the truth. Um, chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. Um, verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Uh, verse 19, same chapter. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. Uh, reassure is another way of rendering that. The epistle seems to be very much about reassurance. And verse 24, one more time here in chapter 3, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us. Those are strong statements um, of confidence that the author uh, and the community of the believers are the true saints. And yet again, in chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, and going for five verses, by this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. He's not going to say that to unbelievers. Uh, we have seen and testified that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world there. I think he's 
uh, alluding to his stature as an eyewitness, which is how the epistle began, and um, and an apostle. Uh, verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Uh, this certainly is a confession that everybody in the church has made. And this epistle, as we're going to see, is very much about uh, orthodox Christology, uh, as to be distinguished We may have confidence that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Um, John uh, himself has confidence that when judgment comes, we are going to be on the right side. He is and his readers. Uh, so uh, really, really strong statements, more so than uh, other books of the New Testament. While I'm in this little paragraph here, call your attention to uh, the repetition of the word no, K-N-O-W. The two different Greek words, and uh, scrolling forward here uh, to uh, the next page, where I've got uh, themes. Um, I've got the Greek word over here. Um, I guess I should apologize, but uh, those are two different verbs that mean no. Gnosko and oida for a combined total of 40 times. 40 times in this little epistle. Five chapters, 40 times. We have the, the vocabulary no. That's number one in the New Testament in density. And then a related word, confidence, occurs four times in this epistle. Um, it seems that these readers were shaken in their confidence, in their uh, whether they are the good guys or not. And I get that partly from this paragraph and a group of verses, but also then from this other paragraph that I want to call your attention to, uh, the occasion of this epistle. Uh, in chapter 2, let me begin at verse 12 and move forward so that you can see how we're rolling here. Uh, verse 12, I write to you little children for this reason. I write to you fathers, I write to you young men. Then he goes through the same three again. Uh, in verse 13, I write to you children, I write to you fathers, I write to you young men. So verse 12, 3 and 12, 13 and 14 are that cluster three categories of the saints in the church, and, uh, and he speaks through them twice. Then verses 15, 16, 17, he speaks uh, to the issue of the Christians in relation to the world. It turns out that uh, this word world, cosmos, occurs more densely in 1 John than anywhere else in the Bible. Um, this is a big, big deal to this author. And uh, this is his strongest 
most uh, uh, convinced single statement about uh, the church in relation to the world. Do not love the world. Kind of simple and straightforward, right? Oh, and what about the things of the world? Don't love them either. All right. I think I know what you're saying here, John, but can you clarify just a little bit? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is strong. This is emphatic. He's trying to make, uh, uh, trying to almost scare them from any kind of um, love for the world. 16, 17, all that is in the world, such things as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, all that is in the world is not from God, not from the Father, is from the world. The world is passing away. Its lusts are passing away. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Okay. Children, we're rolling into this section where I wanted to go. All right. Children, it is the last hour. So you can see that that's the beginning of a new paragraph, a new section. Children, it is the last hour. Now, this is 2,000 years ago. And it was the last hour. And a generation later, after John was gone, after these readers have copied this and passed this epistle on to the next generation, that generation, it was the last hour. And today is the last hour. Just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have already appeared. By this we know that it is the last hour. So, verse 18 is about the last hour, and it is about the presence of antichrists who are anticipatory of the antichrist. First uh, John and Second John are the only two places in the Bible where we have this term, antichrist. It's nowhere in the book of Revelation. And uh, this isn't so much about... Uh, in those first um, 30-ish verses. They went out from us. Finally, he, he hits it directly. Um, and more clues include that these are deceiving teachers. And in particular, they had a uh, heretical Christology that they were uh, propounding. They went out from us. They were not really of us. Uh, let's, let's keep gathering clues, right? Roll on forward. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. It seems possible that these teachers were emphasizing, were claiming to have special knowledge. 
Uh, many have suggested that they were Gnostics or proto-Gnostics. Um, let's keep rolling. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. Maybe some of these teachers were suggesting that the folks who don't follow them don't have the true knowledge. And John's saying, uh-oh, no, no, to the contrary. You have the true knowledge. I'm not writing this because you never learned the truth. In fact, I'm writing because you do know the truth. And no lie is of the truth. He introduces the term lie, and then he speaks about liar. Who is the liar? Not a liar, but the liar, but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Now, this epistle is written in the 80s or 90s, which uh, m many take to be. Uh, notice that John is still using Christ as a title. None of the apostles did what too many scholars today say we find in the New Testament. None of them used Christ as a nickname. It is not a nickname. It's not a name. It's not his last name. It's not his middle name. It never was, and it must never become that. It's the title because this is the Christian affirmation. This is the Christian confession. This is the gospel. Jesus is the Christ. It is too central, too important, too big an idea to, uh, to uh, suggest that, uh, that these founders of the church might have allowed this at some point to become a mere nickname. Again, here we are 20 years, 10, 20 years after Paul and Peter have died, after they've written all that they've written and died, and John is still insisting that the key central issue, the core issue that divides us from them is this, Jesus is Christ. He says to deny that is the lie, and he says this is the Antichrist. Such a one denies Father and Son, because when you deny the Son, you do not have the Father. Those who confess the Son confess and have the Father also. Okay? So let's put this together. Um, this church until recently, had some very influential teachers in it who were speaking to the issue of Jesus and the Christ. And somehow they were deviating from pure apostolic Christology. Happily, for whatever reason, such teachers recently left the church. They probably had something of a following, an entourage, who left with them. And some. so there may have been something of a continuum. Here are these false teachers, and here are their closest uh, followers. And John is going to insist that these teachers are, are not true believers. But it's very possible that some, maybe of the second orbit with them, who are kind of impressed by their charisma, by their logic. Maybe at, at that level, they're actually drawing away some true believers. And then there's a third orbit, and so they're sort of on the fence, and so far they haven't left yet. And John is urging them to 
hold on to the truth, to see the difference between what they are saying and what he and the uh, the other eyewitnesses, i.e. apostles, have always said about Jesus. All right? And so, um, this seems pretty serious. Jesus is not the Christ. Um, it seems possible, but there is a known heresy from the second century uh, known as uh, docetism, Do from a Greek verb, dokeo, which uh, means to seem. Jesus only seemed to be Christ. But to affirm that he is the Christ? No. Uh, the Christ uh, was a spirit thing from God that came on the man Jesus. And uh, uh, so Jesus became the Christ for a time. But to say that he was truly the Christ? No. Uh, some of them, and this again, is known to have been taught in the second century, uh, how early this really got started, we cannot say, because we can only know from extant writings. Um, and there must have been teachings prior to the, uh, the writing of such. And so where did it begin? When did it begin? Um, we can't really say. It seems that this may have been uh, the early precursor, maybe one of the early precursor strands that became more full-blown Gnosticism of the second century. Jesus is the Christ. Well, he sort of was the Christ for a time. Um, some suggest, that, that is, it's, it's in the second century writings, that the Christ came on Jesus at his baptism and maybe left the uh, left Jesus before the cross. Um, jump forward to chapter 4, and we have uh, John return to this issue of Orthodox Christology in the first six verses of this chapter. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. And so in this first couple of verses, we're going to be able to interchange the word spirit and prophet, all right? Seems to me that he's, that this kind of, this reflects a belief in John that prophets are more or less sponsored by spirits. We may have swerved into this idea in a previous class. Beloved, do not believe every spirit and don't believe every prophet, but test the prophets and test the spirits behind the prophets to see whether they're from God. They are good spirits and bad.
false teaching problem, uh, but uh, a similar concern to reassure them that they are the real followers and uh, they need to strengthen their uh, resolve and their faith in Jesus. Let me take us next then back to the beginning of the epistle. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our hands, and so forth and so forth. He kind of repeats himself in these first three verses, but notice what he doesn't do. John, an apostle, called by Jesus, so forth and so forth, grace and peace to you, uh, to such and such a church. This and Hebrews are the two epistles that don't begin like epistles. All the others, from Romans through um, through Jude, all begin with a stereotypical epistolary greeting, opening. Uh, this one just begins, as Hebrews, very abruptly. But here, yes, it is a Christology statement, but it's um, uh, also an apostleship statement. What was from the beginning, that's Christology. What we've heard, he's saying, I am one of that select few of your witnesses to have heard him who was from the beginning and seen and looked at and touched. Ear witness, eye witness, touch witness, direct witness. And John is likely the last living apostle, the last one who can say these things. Notice that opening line, what was from the beginning. Does that sound like anything you've heard somewhere else? Does that sound like a Johannine writing? Yes, of course. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, which, of course, sounds a lot like Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning. Yes. So this is almost certainly the same author as the Gospel of John, and that this is after the writing of the book of John, and that this also so is meant to um, remind them of the book of John, remind them of the book of Genesis, and to carry all of that into a Christology statement. He's the one from the beginning. As the end of verse 1, concerning the word of life. Okay. And uh, we can take the time to work line by line, of course, through these. Uh, he picks it up again in verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. Notice this idea of a chain of revelation. Here was the word of life, the one from the beginning, and we had direct contact, and now we proclaim to you. John and the other apostles were that critical, unique chain line. Other that connects us as directly as we can be connected to Jesus, the incarnate Messiah uh, and Son. Uh, in verse 2, he uh, elaborates a little bit more than in his Christology. Life itself was manifested. The life of Genesis 1, the life of John 1, the word of life in the beginning was the word, and the word was uh, God and so forth, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word was life. The light became, was the light. Life was the light, back to John chapter 1. So he's, he's bringing several of those critical thoughts together. We've seen him proclaim to you, not just life, eternal life, eternal life that was with the Father. Again, John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was God, the word was with God, the word was with the Father. And that one was manifested not to you, but to us. And so we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us 
who have fellowship with him. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Um, so that much is his introduction. Uh, he's, again, moving toward uh, chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us, all right? So that's not really the biggest idea. The biggest idea is Christology and, <clears throat> and abiding faith. It turns out, so let me go back to this. It turns out that the word abide is one of the most common words in this whole epistle. You mean abide like in John 15? Yes. You mean like in John 8, 32 and 33? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, that abiding is all over the book of 1 John. I just did a quick search on A-B-I-D wild card in 1 John and it comes up with 18 verses, 25 hits. I would love to walk you through those um, in my table down below I actually it turns out that uh, the Greek verb meno abide occurs 24 times it's all in chapters 2, 3, and 4 and if you can see what I've got here uh, you know what before I send this to you I'll go ahead and put English uh, translations over here um, but you can see how dense this is and where it is especially dense. Um, but uh, I, So this epistle is about Orthodox Christology and about uh, 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 reassurance. But the reassurance is not just um, uh, you are this, but there's an exhortation and imperative uh, quality as well, be this, be the true believers. Uh, um, reaffirm your faith uh, constantly. Um, so back to this, now to the third paragraph. Um, there are th these three tests. This is one of the most common um, ideas that you're going to find in commentaries up across a spectrum. Uh, almost everybody writing commentaries on 1 John agrees that there are these three tests of true faith in the book of John. That is the idea um, reassure yourself or put yourselves to these tests and you see that you pass these tests uh, and you find great comfort, consolation, I must be one of the true believers. The test of orthodox Christology, what do I believe about Jesus? Jesus is the Christ who is one with the Father who came in the flesh. And so, several places, um, he kind of brings that in and lets it drop beneath the surface. And he brings it to the surface over and over in the epistle. Another test is love versus hate, loving one another, whereas the others are haters. We are lovers. Uh, this, again, another very important theme from the book of John, also 2 John. And then um, what I'm going to call morality, I don't really like that word um, for this, but um, uh, anyhow, it's especially in the terminology uh, righteous, righteousness, and sin, and related uh, vocabulary. So these three tests. <coughs> You believe this about Jesus? Okay, check. Do you find that you're more of a lover than a hater? Well, yeah. I mean, 
maybe not perfectly, but especially compared to 10 years ago, I've been moving in the right direction. Then am I more inclined toward righteousness than toward sin? Do I find myself plotting, scheming to do the right thing rather than plotting, scheming to do the wrong thing, to do sin? Uh, those are just uh, suggestions from me about how John might have us um, uh, apply this and these tests to ourselves. Let me uh, keep going through these lists that I've got here. Other outstanding terms and themes. So as you're reading, pay special attention to the word world. Number one in the whole New Testament in density. Abide. Number one in the whole New Testament in density. Life and death. We saw that that was a big deal in John. So also here in 1 John. Truth and lie. Deceivers. False prophets. Um, but uh, he, he expresses this in stark black-white terms, as also uh, many, many other topics. So uh, while black-white are not terms that John uses, you might say that's a category um, descriptive of how he teaches. Uh, doesn't teach gray area so much as um, stark black and white contrast. Uh, he teaches about the Father and the Son. Even the word Son is, uh, in terms of density in the epistle, uh, number one in the New Testament. Did you notice? Uh, the word we and us, uh, also number one in density in the New Testament. Um, does all of that uh, kind of surprise you? In the we there, sometimes it's we the apostles, but sometimes it's we, you and I. The idea of us and them. Let me, let me call this to your attention. Um, yesterday at breakfast with my son, uh, he was talking about a strong concern of his, how that in way too many of our churches, as he sees things, as he gets a read, on um, Christians blogging and uh, networking and so forth, that there's a blurring of the us-them distinction that is uh, happening in too many of our uh, churches, in too many of our um, brothers and sisters, and some we're not so sure whether they really are brothers and sisters. But uh, let me just walk through these. Chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us. <laughs> That's kind of stark. Us, them. Verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. To you concerning them. Us, them. Radical, stark uh, ca um, categories. There's no blurring of the lines between us and them in this author. And he's speaking for uh, God's perspective. Um, chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has bestowed on us. You stop right there, and uh, Rob Bell and others are going to say, yeah, look at this, that we should be called children. Finish the verse. For this reason, the world does not know us. They don't know us. Us and them. They don't know him. The world does not know him. That's radical. That's stark. Jump forward to verse 10, same chapter. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him, but the one who hates his brother. So there are lovers and there are haters. Those aren't um, smushed together by this author. Now, some of us might look at those and say, well, sometimes I'm a lover and sometimes I'm a hater. Uh, I've got to be honest. But 
uh, this author is not talking about such um, confusion of my identity. Uh, he's just saying it's really stark. Hang on a second here. Jump. We saw it in chapter four, um, the false prophets, and but then in verses uh, five and six, they are from the world. They, those teachers, we in verse six, we are from God. They are from the world. We are from God. They speak as from the world. The world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. Who listens to us? Apostles, those who know God. Who listens to them? The world listens to them. The us, them. Um, chapter 5, verse 10 and verse 12. The one who believes in the Son has this testimony in himself. The one who does not believe. See it? Stark contrast. Uh, and verse 12, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. There is no gray area in the way he expresses this. Back to chapter 1, verses 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Watch this. If we say, verse 7, but if we walk, verse 8, if we say, verse 9, but if we confess, and finally, verse 10, if we say. So this series of five if statements. The first, third, and fifth are if we say, and in each of those, there's saying one thing and doing something else, or saying something flat out isn't true. But if we, in verses 7 and 9, are what John is saying is true and of us, and what he's commending us to continue to practice, to embrace, and to own as identity. So verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, that's a lie. We are speaking a lie, and we are not practicing the truth. Notice how he's smushed together here words and deeds. We lie, and we do not practice the truth. Now, normally when you think about the category truth, we think about words. You either know and speak the truth, or you don't know and you don't speak the truth. You know a lie, you, what you know isn't true, and you speak what isn't true. But here he says, we lie with our mouths and we practice, we do, we do not practice the truth. Words and deeds. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, wait a minute. Who says that? Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, what is the similarity between those two? Uh, people, commentators, have uh, discussed that at some length. Uh, question. Does John think that his readers would say this kind of stuff? Does John think that his readers might know, know somebody who says this? If we should say that we have no sin, if we were to say that we have not sinned, it's obvious that John doesn't include himself in these, even though he uses the pronoun we. That's a little bit curious, but um, Who would say this kind of thing? Have these people ever heard this kind of thing anywhere? We don't know. But I think it's very possible that as soon as John said this, verse 8, his readers 
start thinking of somebody they know. Even verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, that one may not be quite as clear in terms of identifying somebody somewhere. It's kind of a general statement. But you put it together with these others, I think, by the time we get to verse 10, John's readers are saying, I think he's talking about those who went out from us. What do you think? If, if we were to say that we have no sin, I don't say that, but somebody does. If we say that we have not sinned, is John talking about? And then he says, such people are deceiving themselves. They're devoid of the truth. They're calling God a liar. And God's word is not in them. And we still said it in the first person plural, we, us. But this seems to be about this congregation as it was just a few weeks or months ago or something like that. That's my hypothesis, my conjecture, my interpretation reading between the lines. It has to be somebody. But, verse 7, if we walk in the light, as he is light and in the light, we have fellowship, which he talked about in verses 3 and 4, with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So to walk in the light is not to be sinless, but it's to be cleansed, yes. And it's to be cleansed in a present tense, ongoing sense. And then verse 9, if we confess our sins. So it's not a denial of sin. In fact, juxtaposing verses 8 and 10 with 9, we say we have no sin. We say that we have no, not sinned. We confess our sins. They're, these are two radically contrastive groups. We can either be one or the other, but those are so opposite, so distant from one another, that there is no uh, crossover, no bleeding of one group into the other. One group is the confessors, and what are we going to call the other group? Deniers. They're living in denial, uh, a category that um, our counseling students among us will talk about, living in denial. They deny that they have sinned. They deny that they have sinned. And so confession is the opposite of that in this context. As defined by surrounding context, this word confess now means to be those who admit, who acknowledge the reality, who are the opposite of deniers. True saints are confessors of sins and sinfulness. They don't try to hide this from God, um, but they, um, they more than just admit their sinners, they confess um, in a repentant way. Uh, and instantly um, receive from God, forgiveness, and cleansing. Notice at the end of verse 7, cleansing. At the end of verse 9, cleansing. Washed clean. Um, the whole idea of the atonement of propitiation. And of course, it takes us to the cross. Of verse 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9, cleanses us from all sin righteousness. Um, one more time in chapter 2, so the chapter break may be doing us something of a disservice, but it's also transitional into the next section, and we're not just uh, going to be able to keep going verse by verse. Um, my little children, 
and that's his first time to say that, and he's going to say that kind of thing several more times. I'm writing these things to you so that, and that's his first time, first of many times, to say that kind of thing. But he's, so, something new, my little children, I'm writing these things so that. But he carries forward the idea of sin, and this time it is, so that you may not sin, so that you may strive toward not sinning. If anyone sins, we have this. We have an attorney, a defense attorney, before the Supreme Judge, the Father. Our attorney is Jesus, the Messiah, the Righteous One. Je Jesus is called that by Jeremiah, the Righteous One. And there, uh, the righteous one is the king, the branch man king of Jeremiah, the righteous one, who is then the atoning sacrifice. He is the day of atonement, think Hebrews 9. Um, this is John um, saying much the same thing as uh, Hebrews. Um, he's the priest and he's the lamb. He is the propitiation.
believes that Jesus is the Messiah, is born of God. Whoever loves the Father loves the one who is born, the child born of him. Verse 4, whatever is born of God, here it goes to a neuter rather than a masculine, not whoever, but whatever. Curious. Born of God overcomes the world, us, them. And one last time, at verse 18, no one who is born of God sins. He already said that in chapter 3. He who was born, and now there he talks, he's referring to Jesus. So uh, this is the last time that he uses the, the verb to be born, and this is the first time he uses it of Jesus. He uses it of um, the one who was the parent uh, back in verse 4, uh, whatever is born of God, is that right? Uh, no, verse 1. Yeah, in fact, one of these is, yes, active voice. There's only one active voice in the uh, in the whole epistle and it's here in chapter 5 verse 1 everyone who loves the one who gave birth um, in our translations we only have born two times but in the Greek it's there three times uh, so let me translate directly uh, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah it has been born of God. So this is a passive voice that's talking about us being born of God. Everyone who loves the one who gave birth, that's us loving God. So the translation, whoever loves the Father. The word Father isn't there. Everyone who loves the Father, everyone who loves the Father. That word Father isn't there in this, in the Greek. It's everyone who loves the one who birthed us, loves the one who was born of him. Okay. Um, and then the last time is in verse 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins. He who was born of God keeps him. And that refers to Jesus so that the devil one can't the devil one, the evil one, the devil. So there's Jesus keeping us. The devil can't touch us. At that point, he, uh, and here we are at the end of the epistle. Um, he goes one step further in a strong statement of our security, um, the genuineness of our salvation. Uh, while we are here at the end of the epistle, and we're going to take a break shortly, we're going to wrap up First John shortly. We know, verse 18, we know, we know. Our final statements of confidence. take just a couple minutes on this then. The last two pages of this study sheet that I gave you is a table I just created because it's something I just discovered, noticed about the epistle. How many times this author says something like whoever or the one who. If anyone sends, whoever says, whoever keeps, whoever says. Uh, and so forth and so forth, all right? And it strikes me that while there are several places where the author says, you are this, and they are that, and he speaks very directly with words of, of reassurance of his confidence about them, there are these many other places. Look at this, 34 different verses. I think I pulled one out. Um, might be just 30, 
33. Uh, I pulled it out of the table. Um, these 33 times where we have this um, impersonal kind of statement where the idea is you either do or you don't put yourself into that. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He could have said, if you sin. But he's implicitly, and this is rhetoric, this is, um, this is a uh, persuasive style to um, urge something on the reader. Do you dare put yourself into this? Well, I dare not leave myself out of this. Yes, I want that. And so rather than say, if you sin, he says, if anyone sins, we have this advocate. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments. You don't want to be that one. But whoever keeps his word. So of the two whoever's, which category do you put yourself in? Do you want to put yourself in? Uh, and so uh, uh, let me encourage you to take time to, um, to process through all of these. And I, uh, this, this collection of a table um, helps to keep you on that subject so that you don't get distracted with the rest of the epistle. Um, and then you go back and read the whole epistle and you see it coming up and and coming back and back and back. Um, who is the liar? But the one who denies. Well, that's not me. Who is, uh, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies. That's not me. No one who denies, but whoever confesses, the Son has the Father. Okay, so let me encourage you, you might want to pause the recording right at this point and just go through uh, this list. All right, I think that's about all the time that we can take on First John. I'm going to take a break, and uh, when we come back, uh, we'll be on to Second John.